Taunton. I've spoken uh, at Somerset County Cricket, and now I find myself at the Adelaide Oval, two great cathedrals of sport. And your welcome has been equally warm and gracious. Thank you so much for your welcome today. I'm getting out my phone so I can time myself. I'm not looking for a Pokemon, don't worry. If you don't understand that joke, equally don't worry. It doesn't matter. Uh, one of those short-term obsessions for our young people. We have a lot to get through today, uh, and so I'd like to just uh, get cracking and introduce you to the galaxy of stars who will help me uh, speak to you today. First of all, let me look at the four areas where I think our young people are going to be severely challenged in the next generation. The unpretentious version of the title of this talk is, My Kids Will Have It Harder Than I Did. Now, I'm constantly being told by my mother that I have it easier than she did, and I then reply, because I'm a cheeky young scamp, that of course, her mother had it harder than my mum. But I don't think I can make the same case to my own children. There are four areas there where our kids have to navigate a very complex journey, more complicated than mine, and I'll say that a little bit more about that in a second. Here are our superstars. We might come across some of these people in my talk. We might not have time for all of them, but let's look across the top from Leo Tolstoy, top left-hand corner, author of War and Peace and Anna Karenina. War and Peace is the greatest novel ever written. If you haven't read it yet, please let me encourage you to do so. And if you want to know more about Anna Karenina, you might want to come to my talk on 19th century Russian literature, which I'll be doing in February, and he'll be one of the stars of it. In the middle at the top, you'll recognize him as Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, uh, he will, uh, has clearly had a huge impact on Russian history. To his right-hand side, Alexander Pushkin. He features very strongly in my first point. Bottom left-hand side, the breakup of Lehman Brothers. Remember that great event and those very evocative photographs? Do you recognize the next man the, with the funny ears? That is Franz Kafka writer of a number of very prophetic novels at the start of the 20th century. And finally is my bid to try and say something pretty and cogent about technology and chip making, that's a fish and chip van from the north of England. It's the closest I could get to something to do with chips, but actually it's been a very interesting chip kind of week, and I'll come back to that in a second. Let's start off with our children's challenge from government. That is a statue of Peter the Great. It is in St. Petersburg. It is by the River Neva. It's on a plinth. On the plinth is a set of writing in two languages, one Russian and the second Latin. As you can see, Peter the Great is not dressed like a Russian. He's dressed like a Roman leader because the word Tsar in Russian comes from the Latin word Caesar. He was the Great. You don't give many characters from history the title The Great unless they achieve things beyond what is expected of them. He is showing you in that statue what he achieved, given to him by Catherine the Great. He is leaping over the abyss of ignorance and backwardness in his country, Russia in the late 17th and early 18th century. He is trampling down the serpent of wickedness and backwardness. He is taking his country into the future. <clears throat> How did he do that? He built a port. He realized that Russia needed to have a navy if it was going to battle uh, against the great powers in Europe and the great power at his time was the Swedes across the Baltic area. So he built a port called St. Petersburg. He built it on a bog. It is the deepest underground system in the world because you have to travel a long way down to find solid rock. It is, therefore, a very convenient strategy in the event of nuclear holocaust. You can hide your population underground. So there's a bit of cogent thinking there. But he had to have a window onto Europe. Does that phrase sound familiar? Actually, it's a Pushkin phrase from this poem. This is the poem that Pushkin, in 1825, wrote, 100 years after, after Peter the Great's death. Um, he wrote, in tribute, that's the first, and the first stanza of many pages, to that statue and to that man. The bronze horseman, the Miedny Vsadnik, let me read you the first couple of lines. Na birigu pustynek von, stajal on dum velikik pom i vdail gladiel. We have one Serbian speaker here. Where are you? We met beforehand. Where's our Serbian speaker? Did you get all that? I hope that you did. Let me explain what we're just saying. On the banks of the, the windswept banks, hammered by waves, stood he. Look at the second word of 
the second line. It's in italics. It's in its stressed position. Stood he, the great man, poetically, standing there, doom velikich porn, full of great thoughts, and looking, vidal gladia, you can hear the poetry in that phrase, looking into the future. This is a great pion of praise to Peter the Great, the great man who built this visionary city to change the world. Government, power, taking a country forward. Or is it? Because it's built in a bog, sees Petersburg, floods. Because of the floods, the small man, Yevgeny, loses his woman, his home, and his life. He threatens at one point the great statue. He hallucinates and the statue comes down and kills him because the small man was trampled by government. Can you hear the revolution? Can you hear Vladimir Ilyich? A hundred years nearly before the revolution. Actually, there was a revolution in 1825. This poem was very dangerous. It said the small man counts. Who do you side with? Now, our kids are facing a civic challenge. They are facing the fact that they are a small cog in a big machine. There is a dislocation between power and reality. And if we want an illustration of that, let's list them, shall we? The Brexit votes. What a disastrous bit of sleepwalking by the British people. But a little, a little shake of the fist at those in power. The European Commission is so far from reality, it doesn't know what day it is. Look at Donald Trump and his, what they call it, nativism in America. He is making the fears of the, the little man suddenly be articulated. Look at the smaller parties who won power and uh, election victories in the Australian election. There is a concern that people are feeling dislocated from power. How will our children cope as that machinery simply gets stronger? And how does education teach our students to be good citizens when there is this democratic deficit? It's a big challenge. So, moving from there to how about this as a next challenge for our students? On the left-hand side is a bit of brick. Actually, it's from the, uh, the Berlin Wall. On the right-hand side, you've got Francis Fukuyama. Many of you may have known him and his seminal book in 1993. Interesting, because the wall came down in 1989. The end of history and the last man. When I grew up, in 89, the world was very simple. There was a wall. It separated the good guys, the West, America, Australia, all those people with all the right ideas, and the communists. And it was obvious that um, where our allegiances lie. I, I crossed that wall several times. I went to Russia under the communists a couple of times as a schoolboy and as a student, and I saw it for myself. But you know, the world was simple. Ronald Reagan came into power in the 80s to defeat the ideology which was communism. And he succeeded. 89, it all happened. Boy, by 1993, Francis Fukuyama said, it's easy. We've ended history, we've got all the answers, democracy, Western institutions, market economy, the world will now be fine. The world is not fine. The world has been turned upside down by more ideological disputes and splits and problems than ever before. Where is our religious studies teaching in school? Where is our theology teaching? Where is our philosophy teaching? Are we teaching our kids to think and understand just what they have? what they believe, how to articulate that, and how to stand up for that. I think ideology is a challenge for our students. Are we teaching our kids to think or just to make things and get a job and draw a salary? That's a challenge for education and one that Scotch is talking about an awful lot right now. Let's move on to our third challenge. It's economic. Look at those question marks on that sheet. Will the kids have a long-term job? Will they be in the same company for 50 years, 40 years, wherever it might be? Will they have easy access to finance so they can buy their own home? More and more property becoming unaffordable. Will they be afford, able to afford private schooling in Australia? Yeah, possibly. In the UK, no. It's now priced itself out of the market. Will they have affordable university education? I was educated free of charge. My children will not be. Already walking into their careers, they have a £50,000, $100,000 debt. That is a challenge for our young people. When we think about retirement at actuarially, retirement should now be 72. So they're going to have to be as sharp at 66 as I have to be at 56 or 52 years of age. A 50-year career for our students. Doing the same job, will they cope with that? How are they going to manage the economic 
and the, the, uh, the professional challenges of the future. And I think I'm going to add a couple of extra difficulties to the mix. It is some work by McKinsey. I hope you can see that generally. Don't worry about the small words. But, you know, one of the things that is noticeable that McKinsey have realized is if you plot the movement of the uh, critical mass of business from the year 1000 to the year 2000, you'll see it's moved westward. It's moved towards Europe. Of course, it's been helped by America. And in the year 2000, lands somewhere in oddly in Scandinavia. It only takes 25 years, they project, they project, for that critical mass, that prosperity, to move back east. So our children not only have to face uncertainty in their own country, there is a global dimension now to their lives, which we never had to face, but they're going to have to face, when different cultures and different mentalities are going to dominate what they do. And that is going to be a tremendous challenge for our kids. McKinsey, they're a well-known name. They are one of our top uh, advisors and management consultants, a very important piece of work and a very challenging reality for our kids. But you know, that may be negative about prosperity. Let me say something negative about us being so prosperous. This is a quotation from the Sunday Times this weekend. It's a quotation from a book review by Buchholz, The Price of Prosperity, Why Rich Nations Fail and How to Renew Them by Todd Buchholz. Look at that interesting statement he's given us there. He observes that the Greek and Roman moralists lamented the degenerative effects of luxury, prosperity, fragments. It destroys. It's created by peaceful, law-abiding, hard-working, politically stable and socially united nations. But once it's achieved, those foundations become corroded. Those of us who study our classics, our Latin and our Greek, will see that there isn't too much that's new under the sun when it comes to civilizations. There are things to learn from the cycle of challenges and how they were met by the Roman Empire and other empires in the past. And the Roman Empire split and disintegrated due to its prosperity. And that quotation throughout history, prosperous nations have suffered from a powerful tendency to fissure, splinter, and lose their unifying missions. Let me throw some interesting stats at you that he wrote in his piece. In Japan, more nappies are sold to adults than to babies. In America, Obama has generated national debt equal to that accumulated by every preceding president, from $10 trillion to $18 trillion. In Britain, many more young Muslims have traveled to Syria to join ISIS than serve in the British military. This is our first world success. Interesting. It goes on. And this is, I think, quite articulate. The book evokes the vast centrifugal, that's a Latin word, fleeing from the center, powerful forces pushing out that threaten, sorry, it's not Latin, it's Greek, I apologize, that threaten the first world today. Immigration breaks the bonds between neighbors. Wealth separates the rich and poor. Government debt abuses the trust between present and future generations. And the anxiety engendered by such forces is now producing populist counter-movements such as Brexit's experience shows us, and very much one nation, very anti-global and anti-immigration. So, prosperity. Will they have it? Maybe not. Will it be challenged by those who are hungrier and more ambitious across the world? Yes. And if they get it, what kind of a society will they live in? This is a confused picture. This is a disrupted picture, and disruption is a big word that we must be handling in education. Let me come to our fourth challenge. The challenge of technology. Let's go back to McKinsey. Sorry, McKinsey. McKinsey were asked by the uh, American government in the 1990s, how many phone users will there be by the year 2000? McKinsey, bravely, after many hours of hard work and probably quite a few bills, I should imagine, came up with the notion 900,000, Mr. President. That's how many mobile phone users we'll have by the year 2000. The answer was... 108 million. Well, that was money well spent, wouldn't you say? Okay, so what is the challenge of technology? Now, this is um, a stat that's been often quoted in The Economist. They used it about 18 months ago. They did it and repeated it in another article about a year ago, and they've just done a whole series on artificial intelligence and requoted the statistic. But how many jobs can be automated in the next 20 years? How many and which ones? Well, the answer is 
Now, I'm not talking here about, about drilling holes into walls. I'm not talking about building a car here. Three billion dollars worth of legal mediation work was done by a machine in America last year. That's three billion dollars not going through a lawyer when you, your car pranks another car and they haven't, everyone has a big argument about it. Pharmacists make mistakes in 1% of the prescriptions that they write. A machine at Stanford has not made a mistake after a million, a million prescriptions. I have an accountant in the UK. He's called Dale. He cost me a thousand pounds. I use e-tax in Australia online. It cost me $80. Who's, who's going to lose their job? It's not the people who have the small jobs. It's the accountants. It's the lawyers. Uh, we are producing three and a half, no, sorry, 350 lawyers for our university courses, I believe, in Adelaide at the moment for, what, 50 jobs? Because automation is going to change our lives. Uh, driverless cars will not just take out taxi drivers, it will take out insurance companies, panel beaters, it will hit us big and small. It's a massive change that we're seeing in our world. Now, the Economist said, cheer up, everybody. We have the capacity create, to create new jobs. There will be new challenges. There will be new roles that our kids will play. I was, when I was at university, the lawyers were the really bright, admirable people. We, the model linguists, were going to become teachers, so we were looked down upon by everybody, uh, which is to their eternal shame. However, now, the lawyers are without the jobs, but we still need the teachers. It's very interesting. The jobs that machines can't do, by the way, are A, empathy, so counselors and, and, uh, and doctors, nurses, that sort of thing, and B, creativity. So those schools that are emphasizing creative activity and innovative activity are really going to do well in the future because machines can't do that. So, how interesting how the job market is changing for our kids. You'll have heard those statistics about the fact that uh, the top 10 jobs now will not be in existence in 10 years' time. There'll be 10 other jobs that are the top 10 jobs done by our graduates. We need to produce kids who can cope with that. Look at the challenge of automation in terms of the, the, uh, the dividend it will bring. This is a, a direct lift from uh, the Economist article. Look at the sort of numbers we've got here. The annual creative disruption impact. 14 to 33 trillion dollars, 9 trillion reduction in employment costs thanks to um, artificial intelligence enabled automation, 8 trillion in manufacturing and healthcare, 2 trillion in efficiency gains because of self driving cars and drones. This, they conclude, is AI contributing to a transformation society happening 10 times faster, 300 times the scale, roughly 3,000 times the impact of the Industrial Revolution. This is the march of IT. Now, the good news is that if you do have shares in ARM in the last seven days, you've probably made quite a lot of money. They've just been bought by a massive Japanese company in the UK. Huge debates about whether we should be selling the, the, uh, the, the family silver off to overseas companies. But, you know, they've bought that and their leader says they're going to be as big as Apple. So hang on to those shares if I were you or buy them maybe. But please uh, don't quote me if you lose all your money. Um, but the fact is that technology is hungry. They have bought ARM in Cambridge. That's uh, the business park right next to the second best university in the world. Um, they have bought those chips because of the Internet of Things. Your fridge will be doing your shopping for you soon. Your clothes will be telling people information about yourself. You won't need a business card anymore. There will be huge changes in the way inanimate objects do their business. Fascinating. It's coming. It will change our lives. How do we prepare our children for this kind of world? Well, let me give you some important words to finish off with. Exponential change and disruption will be part of their lives, and we must prepare them for them to not mollycoddle them through their education. They will need to be versatile, creative, broad in the way they go about their business, innovative. My son is 22 today. He became a management consultant. Only the first task he had to fulfill in, in involved his academic qualifications. After that, it was presentations, teamwork, trial by buffet, individual interview after individual interview. His public speaking skills, his drama, his music was as valuable to him becoming, an, a, 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 frankly, an overpaid 22-year-old. And he tells me how big his bonus is going to be this year already. I mean, he's only been there for six months, but those skills were as critical for him working for that company than his academic skills. And those schools that simply pursue league table position and qualifications are going to find their kids are not as well prepared as those schools that test their children and give them a disrupted, varied, challenging, out-of-your-comfort-zone education. 
And that is where I believe we should be. We should emphasize entrepreneurship, global mindedness. These aren't SACE exams, of course they're not. Cultural empathy, well-being. It's a difference. There is a world of difference. There is a universe of difference, I believe, between being well qualified and well educated. And that is the challenge our educational systems have got to face. Because I don't believe a degree is enough. We'll be disrupted and disruption is the new normal. And if you want to see a picture of disruption, just have a look at this particular disciplinary challenge for a school. Thank you very much. We've got some time for questions, so if anyone has got some questions, Peter. Thank you very much. That was uh, fantastic. You're preparing young people for a new world. What about preparing parents and grandparents for a new world so that they can actually help their children understand the future? I, I Is there a role for a school as well? I think that's a brilliant piece of work. No one's going to get old anymore. And I really mean that. I really don't believe ageing is something we should be concerned about anymore. Uh, at Scotch, we've just init initiated a, an invitation to all our grandparents to support our uh, uh, research project process because I realise that Grandparents' Day, to which we get 700 people, there are economists, there are surgeons, there are people who are doing most remarkable things, and why should they not be tutoring our students to give our research opportunities so much more umph reality and go? I think the, parents, uh, the, the parent education dimension is important. Uh, there is, there, there is a, a lot we can do in the area of well-being, but also in the area of supporting our parents to be engaged in our children's learning. Not so much a challenge at independent schools, but I, I read uh, in The Economist this morning that some schools are using the technique of sending text messages to parents to remind them that their kids have a test or have a homework due in the next day. This is proving to be not rocket science, but working very effectively. There is a massive need for parental engagement. If you really want me to get heavy with you, I think more parents should pay fees. When they pay, they pay attention. But that's another day. We'll do that one next year. That'll be the next article in the advertiser that'll get me into trouble. I did, by the way, put that into the Guardian in the UK uh, over Christmas time, and um, the list of responses on the website was quite long, I ought to say. It has been, it has been shown that children who study and perform music on the whole do very much better academically than children who don't. How much do you think school authorities should encourage the study of music? Uh, we must do it so much more. It is A, creative. It is B, about handling an audience. It is C, project work. It is teamwork. It has a whole host of advantages. I absolutely agree with you. I think we have overemphasized certain parts of the curriculum and underemphasized others. Margaret Thatcher, bless her soul, had all those playing fields sold off in the 1980s, and yet what do we have now? An obesity problem, and we have a diabetes problem because physical exercise is not an ingrained part of the curriculum. Sporting activities, come on, you Australians, you know all about this stuff. Competition, teamwork, innovation, communication, resilience, how to fight back when you're losing the ashes, or whatever it is you're doing. Um, but it is, sport gives us so much, and music and drama equally gives us so much. All my four children have done music and drama in some form. Even when I have to leave my kids out of bed in the morning to get to a Scotch rehearsal, it's worth it, because I believe there are huge benefits in management. Or the confidence it gives, and the aesthetic dimension is massive. Of course, I believe so strongly in the arts. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, the Internet of Things, or IoT. I've only recently heard of that term. Can you explain what it is? Yeah. When you take the bottle of milk out of your fridge, and, it's, um, and you put, a, put it on your cereal, and it's, uh, I don't know, it's four-fifths empty, your fridge will notice you need more milk. It will add it to the list. So when you go to your computer, and you order your weekly shopping to be delivered, that milk will already be there for you, or it will already have ordered it for you for your standard delivery time on a Saturday morning. Um, if we think, well, what's happening now with Amazon? They're now delivering, uh, they're delivering uh, things by drone. Uh, so another aspect to this is that, um, uh, no, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a different direction, because what they're doing is they're using the crowd. Have you, noticed, have, you, have you heard the story that they're going to pay people who are passing by their, 
their uh, factory in Birmingham to pick up a parcel and deliver it for them at $13 an hour. Why not use the crowd? Everyone's going down the M6, for heaven's sake. Why not give them something to deliver at the same time? But the Internet of Things is about a way of machinery thinking for itself, what do you need, what do I do to make your life more efficient? And if you put chips and communication mechanisms inside your washing machine so it's, it knows what it's done too much, so it saves water, or it doesn't need, the load isn't quite so big, etc., etc., these things are starting to think for themselves. And then suddenly, we'll all be into Terminator and having a lovely time with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Thank you. Um, I thought your address was uh, terrific. I've just been away over in Europe with friends and... Uh, they are good friends of ours have a son-in-law who works at McKinsey and their son is the head of IT security for Ericsson. Now, Ericsson isn't a well-known name, it's a predominantly family-owned Swedish-based company, but everyone with an Apple uh, or Samsung iPhone um, or a Samsung uh, mobile phone, uh, Ericsson get a little bit of clip on that because they did make the chips. And I did speak to him, his name's Brian O'Toole, only in his 30s, I said, Brian, what's, what, what's Ericsson working on now? And he said, the Internet of Things. Mm. That's where we're working right now, yeah. um, and it certainly is the future. So it's going to impact on all of us. Some of us might struggle a bit more than others, and I put my hand up a little bit there. Um, but I, I'm also a chartered accountant, so I've got to say that your comments about the accounting profession are on the money. Uh, we're doing a lot in our practice, but not every practice is. But also, um, it's the other professions, including medicine, where there's going to be profound change. So uh, mm. it was a great address, and how you equip the younger generation through education for these changes is, is your challenge and probably our challenge as uh, uh, older members of society is actually working with our younger family members yep. but also people that work with you and just for ourselves to actually grip, take a grip of what's happening and be aware that change is ever present and it's going to accelerate. Absolutely, so thank, thank you. you. I think cyber security is also a massive area because uh, we all know that there have been huge debates between the French, uh, the Americans and the Chinese about cyber security, protecting our data. Uh, one wild prediction I read recently was that there will be a fourth service. There will be the Army, there will be the Air Force, there will be the Navy, and there will be cyber as well, because cyber attacks are becoming massive. Uh, if you read your history books of the 19th century, just a slight segue here, when you analyze the success of a country, you analyze how, much, how many tons of coal they produced, how many, mi how many miles of railway they, 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 they built in a certain period, and then you knew whether they were a modern economy. In 100 years' time, they'll look back and say, how good was your broadband? That will be how we'll analyze the most advanced countries in the world. How good is Australia's? How good is the UK? UK putting a lot of money into broadband. I hear they're putting broadband now into every road they build. Very interesting. It's very interesting how countries are adapting to these new realities. Thanks, John. That was great. No, it's fine. He's on. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was brilliant about uh, developing creativity, presentation, self assurance. Uh, coping with the unknown, but it seems to me we actually we have our political class calling out for more scientists, more engineers, mm. more technology, and you actually need some foundations in order to actually deliver from those platforms. Mm. And I wondered how you integrated that structure into your creative programs. I think. The secret for me, there's a very, very long answer to that question, Frank, but a secret for me is a school life which doesn't end at half past three in the afternoon. Now, for those really hungry kids and those really hungry parents, yes, they do stay for those things that go beyond the curriculum. They do stay for the entrepreneurship, the problem solving, the model United Nations, whatever else it might be. And I think we need to discuss the formal skills that our kids need. We do need engineers. We do need people who can build things and make things and make things work. Of course we do. But we also need those who are innovative and entrepreneurial who create the next set of answers and the next set of, uh, of, of solutions to the problems we don't even know are out there just yet. Now, I think a school life should be varied. We are working on a scheme at Scotch right now where we put students, even if they're a phenomenal rock, they should be a public speaker. Even if they're a brilliant flute player, they should be thinking about entrepreneurship. Even if they're very good with technology, they should still have some sense of values and what is right and what is wrong and think through their moral positions. We should have the best politicians, but they should also have an understanding of business or, or, uh, or science. We need students with a broad set of skills, a real hinterland of abilities, and a school life must therefore throw these challenges at students from all directions. 
So we are thinking and developing a, a, a school offering which is hopefully chiming with the global realities our kids are facing, integrating innovation, entrepreneurship with those science skills, with those IT skills, with those uh, medical skills, whatever it might be. So we don't just produce the next doctors, we produce the next leaders in medicine. And that's Scottish ambition. Independent schools should have big ideas and big ambitions for its kids. And that's what we have. And I think that's how we're doing it, Frank, and that's how we aspire to evolve our offering over the next two or three years. Um, fellow Rotarians, I am sure you agree this was a very passionate and enjoyable and eye-opening um, presentation. Um, on behalf of all the members of the Rotary Club of Adelaide, I would like to say thank you for taking the time to come and address us. It has been uh, most enjoyable. And as customary, uh, it's just a simple, uh, I was going to say, uh, old-fashioned against technology, uh, talking about our appreciation, John. Thank, Thank you. you so much Thank for you. coming and seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.